Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to tonight's ANU Public Lecture. My name is Adrian Walter, head of the School of Music, uh, and it gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Susan West to you tonight. Uh, I thought it'd be nice to give you a little bit of Susan's background, because I think that uh, Susan is well known for her role uh, in, in community outreach activities in the music education program, uh, but uh, her pedigree is uh, a, a lot uh, deeper and quite impressive, so I thought it would be really good just to give you a little bit of Susan's background, so you can sort of understand the context of which she's actually drawing from. Dr. Susan West brings to her role as creator of the Innovative Music Education Program over 30 years' experience as a performer, educator, composer, and arranger. Her work in developing pre church music programs and postgraduate teacher training is at the cutting edge of music education, with wide ranging influences from traditional music philosophies, both ancient and modern, to holistic and therapeutic uses of music. Dr. West trained in music performance at the Melbourne University Conservatory of Music and the Victorian College of the Arts, and obtained a postgraduate degree in music education from the Gadai Institute in Hungary. She played principal piccolo with the Western Australian Symphony Orchestra in 1980, and then associate principal and principal flute with the Sydney Symphony Orchestra from 1981 to 85. Uh, she was invited to the Canberra School of Music in 1984 to help establish the music education program. She developed the innovative approach uh, to music education, the music outreach principle, a social approach to music making that affects the musical lives of over 10,000 adults and children in the ACT. Dr. West's work has attracted both national and international interest. She not only works as a music educator, but composes and arranges for children, instrumental groups, and for film. Her work is being documented in a range of short films uh, from Ronan Films. She has been recognised for various awards, including a National Children's Week Award, a National Women's Day Award, a citation for teaching excellence from the Carrick Institute, and the prestigious ANU Vice Chancellor's Award for Community Service. Most recently, the Hand in Hand Outreach Programme was recognised for its excellence as a community outreach programme through a national awards programme won by the Music Council of Australia. And I think within the School of Music, she's had a quite a transformative effect on the way we're approaching music education. Uh, and, uh, and the work she's doing is now very much centre stage in driving the, the future of the School of Music. So it's actually a great pleasure to welcome Susan to present uh, her wonderfully titled presentation, Common Artistry, Releasing the Musician with us all. Please welcome Susan. Thank you very much everybody and thank you for coming. It's really lovely to see so many people here and so many friendly faces, many of which I know. And I did realise that there would be people I knew here as well as um, people I don't know. And so I thought about that when preparing this talk because I always find that I need to set the stage in terms of the basic philosophical paradigm of the work that I do for people who are not familiar with it. But at the same time, I, I did want to give some new thoughts, particularly to people who know about this work, uh, and hence the, the title of my talk tonight, and the idea of common artistry, which is, is my way of talking about something that I think is indeed very common, but often isn't regarded as being so. So I'm going to start by um, making a few very broad statements. And um, please see this as a talk rather than a lecture, because I don't propose to give you chapter and verse of all the sources and all the research behind some of the things I'm going to say, because that would take a long time and isn't really the point of, of what I'm talking about tonight. So I'm going to draw some fairly broad strokes to get to um, talk a little bit about the music outreach principle before I go on to show how I think that has given rise to a range of concepts, including this concept that I call common artistry. So first of all, there are problems with music making in our society. The largest problem is that we don't do it. And when I say we, I mean about 94 point something percent of us. I did a lot of work on these figures when I was doing my thesis in 2007, and it does depend whose figures you look at, uh, what the figures look like. The best figures say that about 15% of us make music, and the worst figures say less than 96%. I tend to trust the ABS because the figures that look healthier tend to come from sources that sell instruments, for example. So sometimes one can, can take those with a little bit of a grain of salt. 
we tend not to do it. Now, some of the figures are compounded by the fact that we explain participation in a different way when it comes to music. For example, in the sporting field, nobody would think that you would equate watching a football match with kicking round a football in a backyard. We understand that these things are fundamentally different. The same is not true in music. It's perfectly possible for people to, to produce participation figures that include going to a concert, for example. So people equate going to a concert with participating in music in terms of perhaps singing a song. I don't think those things are the same. Of course, some concerts you go to, a lot of popular concerts, people do join in, fair enough. But if you go to a classical concert and you take your flute along, I don't think you'd be very popular if you started playing. So, you know, that isn't my idea of participation, just attending a concert. Here is a really good example of the modern view of what we think of as music. You've probably seen this quote. It appears sometimes in longer forms on um, fridge magnets, for example. And when I first read this quote, I was very puzzled because it was attributed to Sousa, S-O-U-S-A. Now, you may all know Sousa, John Philip Sousa, who was very famous for, yes, hero, exactly. He was very famous for being a, a march um, director in America and wrote some fantastic marches. He lived between 1854 and 1932. So when I saw this quote, I thought, I don't believe that. I don't believe Sousa at the end of the 19th century would have said this. Because I don't think the idea of singing as though no one is listening is necessarily the way they would have thought at the end of the 19th century. This Sousa actually, according to any information I can find about him, is actually, or was, I think he died in about 2004, and hails from Queensland. And has written some really lovely things, some really lovely things. I think he was a pastor of some sort. So some of his writing is actually really lovely. But I think this is very much a sign of the times that we think that the way to give out our singing most effectively so that we can feel free to express ourselves is when there's nobody to hear us. This to me is a very odd concept and it's also very odd to any four-year-old you might know who is not going to want to sing as though no one can hear them. So this sort of thing is, is slightly strange. Now, there are a lot of reasons, I'm certainly not the only person that says there are problems with music, but there are a lot of reasons given for it, both social and educational, and I don't propose to go through a whole list of them for you, because in fact, in 2007, when I was writing my thesis, I found the drawing that sums it all up. In fact, I didn't find it, a colleague dig, did. I coined a term, and he said, amazingly, that somebody had drawn it right back in 1918. Apologies to people who've seen it before. It looks like that. The t title at the top is Mine, The Virtuosic Mountain. And as I said, I came up with that title long before I'd seen the drawing. The drawing is serious. It's meant as a serious representation of how we reach musical excellence. And you can see that it's got its feet very firmly planted in the Industrial Revolution with the machinery at the bottom. And if you go up the pathway, you can see that it actually takes a long time to get to anything that sounds like fun. <laughs> Industry, <laughs> ambition, Daily exercises, scales, determination, aspiration as you climb up the hill. You get melodic interest about a third of the way up. Interpretation is one step down from artistic triumph. This is, I think, the problem. It's certainly the way we approach elite performance and possibly is not a bad model for that. I'm not suggesting that it shouldn't be used at all. Unfortunately, this model tends to pervade music making in general, even in areas where people think that it doesn't. And there's lots of examples of, of, of that type of problem. Now, as I said, a lot of people are aware of these problems, including me. I became aware of these problems when I was working with children. 
And um, as a practitioner, I fitted very much into the normal um, stance, which still I think is true of practitioners, which is that I didn't really have a solution. There are people who talk about the problem and there are people who are working in the field. Some of those that talk about the problem have theoretical um, suggestions as to how to solve the problem, but often those suggestions have the problem that I call buyback. In other words, it buys back into the same paradigm. For example, most adults don't sing, a lot of them don't sing in tune. Big problem, what are we going to do about it? I know, let's get them all pitch matching. Da, sing that note. No, a bit higher. Da, sing that note again. Da, sing it again. There's actually studies done like this to show how if you get adults to match a note over and over and over again, they learn to pitch match. My question is, why wouldn't you just sing a song? Because you get the same result doing that. Why would you just keep getting people to do an exercise in order to become more musically competent? That's how we treat adult problems with music making and that's what I call buyback because it's built on this sort of model. You keep practicing a note over and over again and that note will get better. And then when you get the notes right, then you sing a song exactly the reverse of what we do or should do, don't always do, with our children. So the solutions are not really there and I was one of those people that really didn't have any solutions. The solution to me didn't present as a solution which is why I think of it as more a discovery because from that discovery other discoveries have emerged and it's only because I was lucky enough to come across an idea from outside of my own domain and it was through the work of a doctor, a medical doctor and psychiatrist by the name of Dr John Diamond who has spent something like 40 years now working in alternative and com complementary medicines but in his early days spent a lot of time working with very, very, very um, mentally disturbed patients patients in what he called the locked back wards of, of the hospitals in those days. And within that environment he realised the therapeutic power of music, not music therapy, but the general therapeutic power of music and over the years has sought to bring that into his work with just normals like us, people who are not necessarily musicians. When I say normals, I'm not talking about people with mental disorders. I'm, I tend to distinguish between musicians who are not normal and everybody else. But I just realise <laughs> I just realised that's probably an insult to some musicians here present, so I'll try not to say that again, I'm sorry. But what I'm trying to say is that, that these therapeutic ideas about music are, though, are ideas that can help all of us in our daily life. The particular idea uh, that I started working with from his work is what I call the music outreach principle. And there's two points about this that are important. The first is that the basic aim of the music is an altruistic, outward directed gesture towards others. The second point about it is that that altruistic gesture that passes on the will to make music is then itself transferred to that other person. In simple terms, the way we describe it to children, and I think it works very well for adults, is to say, I make music in order that you will make music for the mutual benefit of all. And what we're passing on is the entire sentence. So as a musician, it's great for me, I can get you making music and that makes me feel great, but that's usually where it stops. If I can pass on to you the will to then turn to somebody else and ask that person to engage with you in music making, then we have some sort of process that is self-sustaining because I'm giving away the power to make the music. And this is, by and large, what the work in the music education program is about. It's about passing on that idea of altruistically turning on the music in somebody else and asking them to then turn it on in yet another person. And of course the best people at doing this are children for a whole range of reasons. So that is a sort of um, a summary, if you like, of the music um, outreach principle. And what I've really been doing for about the last 12 years is applying that within an academic environment, which has um, proved challenging from a range of points of view. First of all, it's been challenging to me as a musician. And I often say to musicians when I'm working with them, it doesn't matter what you face with this, whatever problem you come up with, 
I've been there and I've done it because it really has, as I've worked through a lot of the implications of this idea, it's given rise to an enormous number of challenges and I've found myself buying back into this paradigm many, many times. It's really wonderful having a lot of teachers involved in this program now who are not musicians because they can point it out to us musicians when we start doing that. Say, no, 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 no. That's not what you are actually about and it's helpful to hear that because it's actually really easy to, to uh, lose track of what this is about and indeed the, the um, activity I'm going to discuss with you now which leads to this idea of common artistry I think really brings that home. So this is one of the, the sort of um, activities I'm going to describe to you now that um, comes out of this idea of the music outreach principle. We run a course that's very popular called Learn the Piano in Three Hours. A lot of people um, do this, this program and indeed some people can walk in the door having never touched an instrument before and leave playing the piano. It usually sells out in about 24 hours, which is really interesting because if we run a, a course on singing, it doesn't happen does happen with piano. What we don't tell people is that if they come to the piano course they're going to sing as well because the singing seems to be much harder to get people doing than the actual playing. And I think it's also because we really associate being a musician with playing an instrument so that if, if people harbour that desire to really play an instrument they want to come along to a course like this. Now we get a whole range of people coming and the activity we often start with is what I call make like a piano player. And what we ask people to do is to go to the piano and we sing a song, it might be Road to Gundagai, that's a popular choice, and ask the person to sit at the piano and accompany the singing like a piano player would. Now, people who don't play the piano might say, I don't play the piano. Exactly, that's why it's called make like a piano player. <laughs> so just go and make something up. Don't worry about the notes, just make something up. And I can often tell, um, sometimes I don't ask people their backgrounds and I, I, I like to look at people's faces when I'm describing this in a session. So you're all smiling, that's fine because I'm not going to ask you to actually do it. But <laughs> if we have a session where we've got people who are going to get up and do it, when I first start talking about this and talk about make like a piano player, people start looking a bit puzzled. And then I talk about it a bit more and some of the faces start to go, oh, and there'll be a bit of giggling and a bit of laughing. And other faces will get more and more serious <laughs> and more and more worried looking. And I bet you can tell which ones are those that have had musical training and which ones aren't. You know, the people that haven't had any training tend to think, oh, this could be a bit of fun, couldn't it? The people that have had training look more and more worried as I talk about it more and more. The first time we did this, we actually had somebody there who'd done it before. And she volunteered to start. I asked for volunteers, she volunteered. And she did this most amazing job of going to the piano and making like a piano player. And I thought, well, that's a good start. But then the next person that went, it tends to be the people who don't play who go first. The next person that went got up, and this was a revelation to me, because she was just extraordinary. She had the moves. She had the bow, she had the posture, but more than that, she had the hands and she had the ability to play across the whole piano. What she did at the piano was amazing, as long as you could let go of the fact that all the notes didn't fit the song. That was the only thing that wasn't okay about it. Everything else was absolutely fabulous. And we've seen this time and time and time again. And sometimes I'll say to somebody, well, that was great. Why don't you play it like a lullaby now? You give us an introduction and we'll sing it like a lullaby. And so the whole playing will change. And they'll do something that sounds like a lullaby. Sometimes I send a couple of people out the room and I said, you work out how you're going to do it and we're going to try and figure out what you're doing. So somebody comes back in and sings and somebody plays. And it's absolutely fascinating because some, they might have an idea, they might know some Beethoven, for example, or they might come back and do it like Elvis Presley or whatever. They'll do it in some way and it's amazing how easy it is to tell what they're doing and what it all means. Or you might say to them, you know, do it like um, Shostakovich and they'll say, well, I don't know who Shostakovich was. Well, do it anyway. And often it'll come out sounding like Shostakovich. <laughs> It's, I mean, Shostakovich often sounds like wrong notes anyway, so that really fits well. So, 
so it's actually, I oh know, sorry, Shasta Kavitz. So it's actually an amazing thing, and particularly with people that haven't had training. That is what I call common artistry. Because as soon as you let people let go of one of the rules that's part of this, musical things start coming out of them. And it's a combination, I believe, of their innate musicianship and what they've learned in a positive way through enculturation. They know what a piano player looks like and they know what a piano player is supposed to do and they can actually do it because we have enough manual dexterity to find our way around a piano as long as we don't have to hit the right notes. So a lot of people are really able to do this in a really, really uh, musical sort of way. That's common artistry and there is this um, uh, research that's been done that some of you may know about that says that it takes 10,000 hours to reach the top of the mountain, 10,000 hours to become an expert performer. I'd suggest to you that many of us have 10,000 hours at watching people make music and that's what we can bring to this idea of making like a piano player. We know what it's supposed to look like and we know how to look that way. Now what about the people who have musical training? Very interesting, because often the people who come up to do this that have had training do all sorts of things that are extremely unpianistic. I've had people come up and go, there's a track winding back, things like that, or sort of put on a, a caricature of being a piano player. I've had people who hear maybe 10 people do this and will come to the piano and start playing the right chords. Now that's fine, they're allowed, but I say to them, do you realise that you're playing the right chords? Yes. Well, could you try not playing the right chords and just using the piano in a different sort of way from what you're used to? I've had people say, no, I actually cannot do that. And that's fine too. In fact, I have to really make it very clear to people that that's fine because very soon after I did this for the first time, I met somebody I never met before. Oh, Susan West, you're, Susan, you're that woman who won't let people play the right notes. <laughs> <laughs> that's called buyback. Because of course I don't say to people, you're not allowed to play the right notes. But I suggest to them that the difficulty they have letting go of the right notes is the problem. It's not to say you're not allowed, but what is tied up in that lack of freedom? What else is not free if you must get the notes right? And we can see this happen with the non-musicians as well, because I, can, I am a musician and I have this problem as well. And even though I would love to run whole sessions where we never touch a right note, I find myself unable to do it because I know that people have come because they want to play something real. So, of course, after a while, we start doing the right notes. As soon as you give people some notes to play, you can see their world shrink. For a start, you give them a C chord and they never want to go anywhere other than here. That's fine, but get a, then it gets scary. So here is fine, any further is really a problem. One chord isn't so bad, but you can't do that much with one chord. You can do a lot with three chords. So we go from one chord to two chords. And just imagine, imagine a picture in your mind of somebody doing this amazing improvisation that has none of the right notes. Then imagine this happening, because this is often what does happen. Won't you play a simple Oh, hang on. Um, oh, just, just a sec. Um, oh, hang on. Um, what was it again? Was it? A, a go, oh, I'll go there, don't I? Yeah. Melody, like my mother sang to. And so on. Now, the thing is, they're so thrilled that they can, and it's great that they can do that. But I would suggest to you that that 
is nowhere near as musical as what they were doing 10 minutes ago when they were playing all the wrong notes. And you can see this in children too, when they pick out a tune on the piano. They will often completely lose any sense of rhythm, any sense of flow of the music, any sense of the song, because they're so busy picking out the notes and they'll have no idea that that's happened. So people doing that sort of thing won't actually really have a clear idea that they're stopping and starting because getting the notes right is what matters. Now it's fairly easy to overcome this because what we do is this, stand up, turn around, sing. singing the song then you have to keep going whether you like it or not so it's a really great way of getting people to overcome that problem and that's why we often do this in groups so that the, the piano player is driven forward in the music making so the the um, particularly the people that haven't had the background will often become more restricted the piano players in the first instance might become more relaxed but that in itself can provide its own sorts of problems particularly if they start offering really good advice to other people who don't play the piano on exactly how they can improve their piano playing because you see these people who've done these amazing free things and feeling very relaxed and comfortable becoming more and more concerned about their playing as they get more and more advice on how to actually play the right notes. This is the power of the right notes and as soon as you get away from that you can see this concept that I call common artistry. Now I'm going to give you another example of that. That's an example that applies pretty much to people who perhaps are non-musicians but with some musicians. The next example involves some work we've done more than once with groups of young elite musicians and I'm going to give you a little bit of passive role playing to do now. You don't have to do anything except pretend you're somebody that you're not. So um, the first time we did this was out, was out of state, it wasn't in the ACT. Imagine that you are a group of 15, 16, 17 year olds who are pretty darn good at your instruments, mainly string players of some sort or another. So I'm going to talk to you now and introduce this idea as though that's who you are, just to show you how we went about doing this the first time we did it. Um, it's a very little known fact that Shostakovich visited Australia. Um, it was in the early part of this century and uh, no, not many people know this and Shostakovich really, really uh, loved Australia and he loved the music of Australia. In particular some of the songs that we sort of think is almost folk songs. And what he did was he did some really fantastic arrangements of these songs. And uh, what I'm going to do is get a couple of people, um, Georgia and Lauren, do you mind? Uh, you know this piece, don't you, I think? Yes, yes. Yeah, okay, good. Uh, I'm going to um, uh, get Georgia and um, Lauren, two of my colleagues, two of my music musician colleagues, to um, help me sing this piece for you. Now, since you're all trained musicians, what I'd like you to do is uh, pick a part to listen to. I'm doing the lowest part. Lauren, you know the middle, middle do you? Right. Middle, Lauren's doing middle, and um, Georgia being one of those soprano people is going to do the high part. So just pick a part to listen to and after we've sung it once, I'll be asking um, some of you to, um, to come forward and um, just um, have a go, okay? <coughs> There's a track winding back to an old fashioned shack along the road to Gundagai Where the blue gums are growing Beneath the sunny sky Where my mother and father are waiting for me And the pals of my childhood once more I shall see Oh no more will I roam when I'm heading straight for home Along the road to Gondor So, I'll step out of character now, and you can step out of character. So we asked for a volunteer, and um, the faces were like you'd expect from musicians. I think, oh my goodness. And then one, the first time we did this one, I think it was one, it might have been two, I can't remember Georgia, one or two people um, 
said, yes, I'd have a go. And they were both male. I think that's actually significant. So they came out the front and we had to have one of us with them and they had a go. And then we had another turn. Who else would like a go? And gradually you're seeing these faces changing. And then there's a little bit of whispering going along amongst it. And after a while, more and more people were putting their hand up because they finally got the point that we were just making it up. Because every time it was sung, it sounded different. So we're just doing something with a high part and a middle part and a low part. It's not real. It's just a bit of improvisation. But it sounds sort of like it makes sense, particularly if you do it with a degree of confidence. Some of the kids managed to work this out. And I should just say that no young musician has been hurt in this process. <laughs> <laughs> because I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily do it with a group of older musicians, but younger people tend to roll with the punches and they, they find it amusing, they figure it out pretty quickly, they find it amusing. Boys tend to get it sooner and my, my take on that is that I think that girls really take on board the getting it right stuff. You know, teenage boys are probably a bit more inclined to sort of get out there and just have a go and who cares, whereas the girls worry more about it. So once they realise, oh, I can sing anything I want, then they'd come forward and have a go at it. And of course, again, once they were released from this idea of notes and realised they could just make something up, what they came out with was often really, really amazing. So then we'd start saying things like, right, well, every time you get to a cadence, that's the end of a phrase, every time you get to a cadence, try and make it a major chord. But don't do anything, just try and all end on a major chord. Or then, you're all ending on major chords at the end of the cadence. That's don't do that. Make sure it isn't a major chord and so on. And I find if you've done this quite a bit with people and you're really tuned in, interesting things start happening. I was rehearsing this, we just tried it the other day, George and Lauren, and, and almost every time I looked at Lauren we sang a unison. We were nearly always on the same note, which is sort of interesting, or else we get to the end and we think, oh, hang on a minute, we don't want it to sound like it actually finishes, so somebody needs to slide. Some, and then we'd both slide together so we ended up with a different version of the same chord. So it's amazing once you start tuning into these things that you start doing things that we consider musical. So leaving aside the right notes, what we were getting those kids to do was very, very nice in terms of the whole ensemble performance. Now you can also look at this from the other end and I've got some what I think are just absolutely amazing examples to play for you now. One of the many wonderful teachers I work with in the system rang me up one day to say she'd been asked to a school to do some literacy. And what she wanted to do was get these kids, and it was going to be volunteer groups of kids of various ages, to um, write uh, the, a poem that was a lullaby and then set it to music, so compose their own lullabies. And she said, um, I'm going to need your help with the singing part of it. And I said, well, actually, no, you're not but I'll come along and I'll show you how to do it. So first of all, she got the kids writing the poetry and sent the poems through to me, which in itself was quite amazing. And then I went along and we had tried, the whole point was to be as lacking in intervention as possible. So she'd done a little bit of talking about lullabies and um, you'll see she'd done a couple of other things, which you'll notice in a minute. And then I just explained to them, well I didn't really explain to them, I just said, so tell me about lullabies. Well, it's what somebody, it's what mum sings to the baby. Yeah, but it's also what an older brother or sister can sing to a other brother. Yeah, sure, that's right, yeah, sure. And what's it like? Well, you know, it's just a sort of a bit of a something. And eventually I gave them the world lilt. I said, you know, it's not necessarily, you don't have to necessarily make it a song, it can just be a little bit of a something, you know, and just a mother singing very quietly to her baby. So we did one person and then I stopped the whole show because I've got to go and get a tape recorder. And um, what they did, they had, this, they had their baby, I think it was a pet, a rabbit or something, rabbit toy, and they were right next to the microphone. And this is some of the things that came up. Now these are from children who were about, uh, they're all junior primary this lot, so the, the oldest would be about seven, five, six, seven, that sort of age group. That's number one. I'm sorry it's so soft. Here's number two. So you can 
probably already guess one of the things she played for them, Brown's Lullaby. But it was about two weeks before that she'd played it. So the fact that any of those kids remembered how they went to that extent is in itself amazing. And you can see how sometimes their words got to the point where it didn't fit anymore, so they just went off on their own tangent. Here's another one. Go to sleep now, close your eyes. Dream of soft, fluffy clouds floating, floating through the sky. <coughs> I love you forever. Think of shells being carried slowly by the current. And then this one. <coughs> and this baby drank you cry because I will see you all the time. that was obviously started as Hush Little Baby, it's American folk song. And then you can hear that gap where he's thinking, oh, hang on a minute, I don't know what's coming next. And then he went off onto his own tune, so it sort of morphed into something completely different. I'm sorry it's so hard to hear the words, but some of the words are quite amazing. And in fact, I had a friend, the same friend who showed me that um, drawing of the virtuosic mountain also did a study of lullabies. And he said, it's amazing how many adult lullabies have a little bit of a hidden, if you don't go to sleep, you know that there's that new book, if you don't go to sleep. <laughs> and the kids' ones don't do that. It's all about how much they're loved and how safe. There's none of that if you don't go to sleep you know, something terrible is going to happen to you. Oops, <laughs> I've just lost it again. Now, these last ones, you can hear that these kids, maybe this one, maybe the next one, actually didn't use any of those referencing materials at all. They just did their own thing. <laughs> that one's not doing anything, is it? Let's try this one, hang on. Dream about flowers sparkling that's right. Dream about a rainbow sparkling on top of you. Go to sleep, you will not alone. Always calm, don't worry, close your eyes. <laughs> it's very adorable, isn't it? And this one is very nice too. So that's also what I call common artistry. That's what's in children, particularly if you don't try and do anything with it. It's often hard to hear that degree of musicianship when they've got this thing, whatever it might be, that they have to do something with, because it gets in the way of them just being able to make music in that sort of way. So what am I saying, what am I saying common artistry is? I don't think I've got a complete definition yet. But I think there's a few things. First of all, it's what is innately in us 
at birth. And it's perfectly understood that this is the case. This is nothing, there's nothing new in this, this idea that we are all born with musicianship in us. What is not commonly looked at is how the process of enculturation may help that common artistry and how it might in some ways hinder it. And it's the hindering of it that I think we need to do something about. I would suggest that for me, common artistry is actually the musicianship in us that is fighting to get out. You know, we talk a lot about the stresses of modern life. Sometimes when I'm working with people singing, they get stressed by the act of trying to sing. But I'd like to suggest to you that I think the stress we all have in suppressing our natural urge to make music is much, much worse. The actual singing and the stress involved in doing that, if you've never done it, is really a bit of a paper tiger. And most people who get past that point, uh, we, we often in sessions where we get people to sing who haven't sung before, people cry a lot, but it's not necessarily a bad thing because often they're crying with relief because it actually feels so good when they just get up and sing. Not singing as though no one can hear you, but singing with other people and indeed on one's own as well, because I think often the whole choral experience can actually give us this idea that it's okay for me to sing as long as nobody can actually hear me still. It's the sort of, it's a bit like the Sousa, only not quite as bad. There's nothing wrong with all of us having our own voices being heard, whatever we may think of our voices. What, the other thing about common artistry is that it's about personal, chosen self-expression. And again, that's often hard to find in music, particularly for the young, because we have a lot of ideas about what they should be doing. So setting up a, 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 an approach in which we are all able to choose how we express ourselves musically is also really important. And part of that, I think for me, the, the idea of common artistry seems to me on the basis of the work we've done with the Music Outreach Principle, to include this idea of willing others to engage with us because that's what we want. We want to make music together because the best research or the best theories we have about this idea of music making, particularly through singing but also with instruments, is that it is about helping us be glued together as a society and if we're not doing that we quite literally I think become unglued. And I think we can see a lot of that in the bullying that goes on in schools and so on. I'm not saying this is a miracle cure for all of these things, but I do think that if we consider the lack of music making as being a serious problem alongside some of the other serious problems we're dealing with in our world today, some of those other serious problems might have different solutions because if we're making music together, the other things we're doing together might change. So, What's my solution to this? Well, if I had my druthers, I'm going to make a radical suggestion for you. If I had my druthers in order to help fix this problem, what I would do is suggest that there should be absolutely no mandating of any musical outcome of any sort for any one of school age. Exactly the opposite to what happens now. Doesn't mean that we wouldn't give them lots of opportunities, some of which can be very, very cheaply provided. I know because we're doing it here in Canberra. You give them lots of opportunities, you give them lots of possibilities for engaging with music, but you don't ever make a child do anything musical they don't actually want to do and that they don't choose. It's pretty simple if you're a parent to do this. All you have to say is, no, 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 it's mummy's turn on the piano, you go away till I've finished and the child will be killing you to get to the piano first. So the next bit of my suggestion is that while I would never mandate music making for anybody, I think we as adults should actually start taking a bit more responsibility for this problem. The problem has been given to us because of our childhood experiences. We have our own innate artistry and we have experiences that have encouraged that artistry and we have experiences that have suppressed it. We as adults should be the ones that try and overcome some of that. There should be some pressure on us 
as adults to deal with our relationship with music because that's the best way we can encourage children to engage. So we don't end up with all these concerts where you've got all the children on the stage singing to a mute group of adults looking at them. What message does this give to our children? You keep doing the music until you leave school and then you stop because that's what happens. If we were stopping that from happening, if we were the ones making the music, then it would be automatic that the children would just be doing it with us because that's what children do. We don't have to teach them to do it. It's in our education system because we're not doing it in our homes anymore. So I think it's a problem that's actually up to us to solve. And I thought you might like to make a start on that tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so before I give you your opportunity, which is absolutely voluntary, I would never ever suggest that anybody has to sing anything. Feel free not to sing, but you can take this opportunity to sing if you would like. And there's a lot of people here that I know know this song, so if you do know it, you can turn to somebody who doesn't know it and possibly help them sing it as well. I'd love to be able to say something really um, profound like, you should sing as though your life depended on it. <laughs> but we know that's not true. That's the trouble with music. We know that we can all live actually pretty fulfilled, happy lives without ever making any music. We know that because 96% of us do it. But what we can say, I believe, is Make music because the quality of your life depends on it. And perhaps more to the point, make music because the quality of your children's lives depends on it. If we make a difference, if we start living our common artistry, then it makes it much, much easier for our children to do the same. And on that note, here is your song. Nearly everybody knows this song, I know. So if you, if you would like to sing, please stand up because you'll sing much better standing. And those that know it, turn around to those that might not. We'll give you a couple of goes through so you get the hang of it, okay? Yes, if you need the words, that's okay. the MEP course because they're the ones that went like that at the end. <laughs>
Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.